Welcome to Prescribing Prosperity with your hosts, John and Alex Sutsos from MedWealth Financial Services, operating through IPC Securities Corporation. In this podcast, we provide unique insights into wealth management, the psychology of financial decisions, and help listeners place the capital markets into perspective. Our aim is to help physicians, business owners, and other medical professionals to live their dream. Life is to live and enjoy, so we'll also cover health and lifestyle-related topics such as food, dining, travel, and unique experiences. Learn how global trends shape our investment strategy as we help you assemble your roadmap to prosperity. Hello, and welcome to the Prescribing Prosperity Podcast with your hosts, John and Alex Sutsos. Gentlemen, hello. Good to be with you again. Hi, Bill. Nice hey, to see John. you again, Bill. Yeah, Alex, good to be with you as well. So what's on the table for this episode? What are we talking about? Well, today we're going to be talking about financial planning for major life events. Uh, I just went through a major one uh, myself right now. And so it uh, sparked an idea in my head that, you know, uh, for a lot of people, they're going through major life events, no matter what stage of your life that you're at. And if it's not you directly who's going through it, then you're going to have a family member that uh, is likely going through it, whether that be a child or a grandchild. And so it's uh, a topic that is going to be relevant to a lot of different people. Oh, excellent. Very good. Well, since most of us do go through these major life moments, <laughs> and, and sometimes not so comfortably or, so, you know, not so easily, That's for let's sure. get this conversation started. Where do you want to start, John? I think what we're going to do is we're going to try and take this in a, a bit of a chronological order. So the way we've uh, we've laid it out here, we've got uh, a number of different events. So, you know, we're going to start off with topics like buying a car, getting married, buying a house, having children, uh, planning for a child's education once you have children, changing careers, managing the, uh, the declining health of yourself or uh, a parent yeah. um, or a spouse for uh, for many people. Divorce, second marriage for those people who uh, who go through that. And then, you know, uh, one of the regular ones that we come across in our profession, which is retirement and then death of a spouse and then death of the uh, the second spouse or, uh, or a parent. And so uh, obviously we're not going to get to all of this today. We're going to make this a, a multi-part series so that we can uh, get into it for uh, in, into enough depth that it yeah. provides value to people. But uh, for those, as I mentioned, who are tuning in and thinking, well, I'm not going to buy a car or I'm not getting married right now, you may not, but you may have a family member who will be soon. And so there's still valuable information that you can potentially pass along to that family member. So, uh, well, you know, it's, get... it's interesting. You're going to start with buying and leasing a car because weirdly, I was well into adulthood before I ever leased a car. I had a really? dad who liked a horse trade car. So he was always, so I was just <laughs> the idea of buying cars, you know. Right. In fact, I, 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 every time I came home, I didn't know who was in the driveway. And I found out it was my dad had sold that car and bought a new car. And that was the car that was in the driveway. <laughs> so, what was the best one that he had? What was the coolest uh, car that he bought? I, I ended up getting an MG, 1968 MG midget in, 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 in the process there for a while. Dual carb, sat all of like maybe three inches off the road. <laughs> <laughs> so you were feeling everything. <laughs> You felt everything in the car. I was about the size of the car. So I always felt like I was getting Jeez. dressed when I got into that car. It's like, let's put on that car. But <laughs> I bet you that thing could fly, though. You know what? It was the funnest car I've really ever driven. I I, I would just disappear for hours, and I would just be out driving. I would literally would nice. be just out driving. So I know how to nice. buy a car, but I'm interested to see what you have to say. And, and and leasing a car was a whole new experience for me the first time I did it. So take oh, it away. I think that's a good starting point. I, I had another starting point, but uh, okay, Dad, buying or leasing a car, your, your <clears> favorite <throat> subject. I wouldn't say it's my favorite subject, but uh, <laughs> it's certainly a subject that comes up quite uh, frequently in conversations with clients. Um, and I'll start off with this uh, anecdote. I had a uh, an optometrist I used to do business with who has uh, since retired. And he was an aficionado of motorcycles. And uh, every time I would go in to see him, which was usually once a year, he would tell me about his latest and greatest Italian uh, motorcycle or, or, oh. or, or 
or, or other uh, car that he might be driving. And uh, so we, we chit chat cars and motorcycles. And <clears throat> one day I came in and I said, well, <clears throat> Ron, are you um, saving any money or are you still putting money into depreciating assets? <laughs> and and um, because we had our, our, always, I've always encouraged him to save money now from the time I met him when I was 18 years old. And so he was part of the early stages of my career and I was encouraging him about saving and investing. And um, I had forgotten that I had said that. And apparently it stuck with him. And years later, I came in for a, a routine appointment and he said, I said, how's it going, Ron? He says, I still feel guilty because I'm still buying depreciating assets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, well, uh, I, I suppose uh, uh, you're going to learn your lesson sooner or later because uh, we all get older and eventually we're going to need to rely on some money. So it's important to to have some savings accumulate. The, com the co topic of buying versus leasing comes up quite frequently with clients, especially uh, today, the majority of my clients are older in their retirement years and mm -hmm. periodically they need to replace their car. And being people that are typically older than I am, they're accustomed to the mindset of when you need something, you you save up money for it and you buy it. Yep. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. But going back to the comment I gave the optometrist, uh, when you have money saved up, where do you want to put it? Do you want to put it into depreciating assets or do you want to put it into appreciating assets? And as a professional investor, I always encourage people to put money into appreciating assets. So buying a car is wonderful. And, and typically the, the pushback I get from people is, well, you know, over the course of 10 years, it's cheaper to buy than lease. And I don't dispute that. It is cheaper to buy than lease over a ten over ten years, but the price of the car is not the only thing you need to be considering mm. when you're making this decision. And this takes me back to another anecdote, and that is when Alexander was first born, and I remember at the time my wife and I had purchased a, a Mazda six two six four door sedan, nice family car, mm -hmm. and we had purchased it about three, four years before Alexander was born. And um, he was, uh, I, the car had had just come up. I finished paying it off. It was about four years old. I finished paying it off. So felt good about the fact I didn't have this monthly payment any longer. And a lot of people psychologically don't like this idea of monthly payments. And then <clears throat> it's the middle of winter. And she bundles him up in his snow snowsuit, sticks him in the back seat in the in the the uh, the child seat, uh, and he looks like a stuffed animal with his <laughs> arms and legs sticking out and the little two sounds about right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he looks really cute. And then they're leaving the house. They're driving off, and I'm watching this house. And my my wife and my child in this car motoring away from me, and I'm thinking. Is this the absolute safest car on the planet for my child? And I, I decided, no, it's not. It's a four-year-old car. And in as much as I, I love the Mazda 626, its construction was not exactly as sturdy as some other cars. At least not at that time. We're talking the uh, early 90s. So I decided I was going to go out and get a higher quality vehicle. Uh, and I didn't buy it. I leased it. Now, my wife is is not in business. She doesn't get to expense the lease. But the rationale I had is that the premium we're going to pay over the course of 10 years on leasing a car versus buying a car, and the premium is not huge, it's marginal, but the premium we pay is going to ensure the safety of my family. Mm. And and that was the most important consideration I had in leasing a car for my wife, who, as I said, does not have a business. Now, for myself, I always leased because I run a business. So that was my rationale. Now, the other thing is when you lease a car, you don't keep it for 10 years. You typically will keep it anywhere from three to five years. 
average is about four. And what happens every every four years or so is you hand the keys back into the dealership and they give you back another uh, set of keys to a new car. Now, in the meantime, the way most leases were constructed, at least back then, and to a good extent today, is the person leasing the vehicle puts down a deposit in, the, in effect, buying down the monthly payment. And then you have a residual value that's calculated uh, by the uh, uh, car company. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the time frame, the amount of money you've paid over the, over the term of the lease exceeds the residual value. So by the end, if it's not close, there's a slight surplus in your favor. So you always get a little bit of money back and they apply it to the next vehicle's um, uh, value and they pay down the, the monthly payment again. So after going through this exercise a couple of times, I thought to myself, this is crazy. Why am I putting money up front, giving that money to the, at the, the car company and then getting back this money, a little bit of money at the end they basically gave them an interest-free loan. Uh, yes, I get the fact my monthly payments were less, but it made no sense to me. I'd rather, uh, given the fact that the car depreciates in value, I'd rather pay as I play. So what I started doing is instead I would tell the uh, car dealership, I'd say, I don't want to put any money down. Zero down. Everything that is part of the delivery process transportation, luxury tax, whatever kind of uh, taxes there are, roll everything into the lease. I don't care that my monthly payment is a little bit higher, but I'm not going to pay up front for mm -hmm. something that goes down in value. I would rather sure. take that upfront money and invest it. And since I'm a professional investor, that made a lot of sense to me, but you don't have to be a professional investor. You can simply turn it over to your professional investor that you that you hire and utilize and have them invest your money. So at the end of three, four or five years, your money is actually growing. It doesn't just come back to you as a refund of money you've, you've given up front. Well, and it's mm -hmm. also just, you know, having capital available to you, even if you were to do nothing with it, which I, I wouldn't encourage, obviously, I would encourage people to invest that money. But the the notion of having your money sitting there doing nothing in a car that is de that is depreciating in value is not logical because you could be utilizing that cash flow for other expenditures obviously we know there are a lot of expenditures that come up over the course of time that are unexpected and so to have a little bit of buffer to have a little bit of margin is also th that has value as well and i don't think people they don't know how to quantify it and so therefore they don't place any value in it in the flexibility of having that cash flow and i think that's uh that's a mistake, and that's another argument in favor of leasing rather than um, rather than purchasing a car outright. To say nothing of the fact that you know we've we've talked about the cost of uh, of you know the peace of mind for you in terms of safety, but there's also the the cost of the fact that uh, safety obviously improves every year with a with a car. Every four years, I mean, from year to year, cars have incremental changes that occur. But every four years or so, depending on the car manufacturer, sometimes it's three, they overhaul the entire frame of a car. So the, the entire model of a car, so we'll, we'll pick an example, uh, BMW 3 Series. So every three years, the BMW 3 Series gets completely overhauled. They will take apart everything and they will completely build a brand new chassis for it and build a brand new framework for the car to account for changes that are developments that they've made in the nature of safety. Uh, performance, uh, fuel consumption. That's another one. You know, people, you know, they, they want to save money. Well, if you have a more fuel efficient car, you're going to save money because you're not consuming as much gasoline. That's fewer times that you have to go to the pump. Even if you're using an electric car, it's fewer times that you have to uh, charge it and you have to pull uh, electric electricity from the grid, which costs money. Like there, th those are still cost savings that you're going to incur by having a newer car. So, so Alexander makes a good point. Uh, cars do get re, uh, redesigned uh, periodically. I don't know that it's as frequently as three years. I think um, it's probably closer to five. But you know, the point the point is still valid. The cars are restructured every uh, every um, uh, so often, and there are uh, design improvements. But the, the the design improvements that I focus on are safety. So, for example, a number of years ago, there's a new law that came in. 
that said uh, uh, side impact door beams had to be inserted um, in new vehicles. So if you are on the wrong side of that technology and you get T-boned at an intersection, the chances of you surviving are very low. But if you acquire the new car, which has the side impact reinforcement beam, that could mean the difference between life and death. And that's a bit of an extreme example. But that's a kind of uh, mindset that I, I like to have when I'm looking at vehicles is I want my family to be in the safest car possible at all times. The other thing is reliability. And so, and Alexander touched on that point as well. The last thing you want is to, to have your car break down, particularly in a bad neighborhood or particularly during bad weather or at a great distance from home or at a, a great distance from anywhere. You might be traveling in between towns and there's nothing and your car breaks down or worse, it's your spouse who may, may have less knowledge about vehicles than you do and, and they're going to be on their own. So again, the, the benefits of being in a new car is greater reliability. Let's face it, a lot of people are on the go. They're, they're running late. Most people are running late. They want to get in their car and go. The last thing you want is you get in your car, you turn the ignition switch, and nothing happens. Click, 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 or com complete silence. The car's not moving. Mm -hmm. what, what the hell's going on now, <laughs> right? So now your stress level has just gone from six to, to, to 11 because you're late, you need to go, and nothing's happening. This thing's not moving. Now what are you going to do? Now you're going to make a blizzard of phone calls, maybe get, you know, get out of the car, find your spouse's car, call a friend, call a family member, and, and now you're scrambling. So reliability is critically important, especially- I, I know Sorry, I was just going to say, I, I know that there's a lot of things in, in this world that, you know, uh, a common refrain is, oh, they don't make it like they used to. I think we can say, uh, for the most part, I mean, there's certain elements of the cars that I think, uh, Bill, you, we talked about, uh, uh, they didn't have the uh, the restrictor of the carburetor on uh, on your first, your favorite car, right? The MG uh, Midget? No, no, it's a dual car. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I had to open that hood up at least twice a week. Yeah, it does, but from a yeah. performance standpoint, you know, yeah. that, that maybe uh, changed the, uh, the performance of the car. But overall, I think no one in their right mind would say cars 30 years ago or even 10 years ago are better than cars now from a safety standpoint, especially. Even from a performance standpoint in a lot of cars, you know, it, it, oh. I, one of my, my brother-in-law, he works at Honda. And uh, one of the things that he and I frequently talk about is just how impressive it is that the technology has changed such that they can get away with a four-cylinder engine in most cars and, and still derive fairly good performance out of it, uh, despite the fact that it's a relatively small engine, which allows them to manage the fuel consumption and uh, allow them to uh, be fuel efficient, which is a major concern for a lot of people. And so, sorry, go ahead, Dad. <laughs> No, I was, I was just going to say, Bill, uh, you remember in uh, your day and my day when we were young guys, yeah. um, we, we would pop the hood even when we when there was nothing wrong, just to uh, look at the engine, <laughs> fine tune a couple of things, show show the boys. Moment of you know, zen meditation as you just yeah, looked yeah. at it. Yeah. yeah, just look at it. You know, you need an oil change. It's something you could do on your own. Yeah. Uh, the carb wasn't functioning correctly. You know how to tinker with it. The timing, uh, what do you call the uh, the little timing timing oh, wheel? Timing belt. Yeah, yeah. Time, time, all that stuff. Well, today you open up the hood of a car and there's a freaking computer in there. Amen. It's true. G good yeah. luck. You can't even change the you can't even change the air filter in the car. Yeah. Don't you? yeah. Good good luck. So <laughs> so even even do it yourselfers are gonna have a hard time yeah. with today's cars trying very, to fix something true. that's that's not operating. You gotta the, what the car engine's gonna have on it is an outlet that plugs into a, a computer that will analyze it. And yeah. uh, we don't have these an analyzing uh, computers at home that we can plug into. So no. reliability yeah. is a big deal. And uh, this is um, the, 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 the principal reason, safety and reliability is the principal reason that I encourage people to, to lease a car instead of buy it. And the, the other major reason is you want to make productive use of your money, put your money in appreciating assets, not depreciating assets. I would say the 
the only time it really makes sense if you want to buy a car is if you're at a, a, a wealth level that is so extremely high that you have it's basically a, a throwaway for you. It's it's a toy. You know, you're if you're going to go and you're going to buy a, a Ferrari or an Aston Martin, that's fine. If you're going to go and you're going to buy a vintage car that is um, a, a classic and that will actually appreciate in value, uh, you know, there's I, I want to say, I'm, don't quote me on the year, Bill, but I'm pretty sure it's like the 1970. When did they put the restrictor in? Was it 1970, 1971? Which restrictor? Uh, Are you talking about the catalytic converter? Yeah, catalytic converter. That was uh, uh, mid seventies. Yeah, mid seventies. Okay, so somewhere yeah. the the early seventies muscle cars, the Charger, the Mustang, the Camaro. Um, the Camaro. Those cars have actually appreciated in value because there's so few of them that are available, and people are willing to pay a premium to get them, and so car collectors will pay more. They will appreciate over time. That's a unique scenario. Well, you know, it is a unique scenario. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you look at, and part of it also is just the design of the cars was so different. Yes. You know, every every car had a really distinctive, different kind of design to it. Yes. You could not mistake a GTO for a Camaro or a Camaro for, you know, a Charger or a Mustang yeah. or, a, or, or a Stingray. It's like, you know, very, very different time. Very different time. Yeah. And now, now, John, my only response to you is the only reason to put money into a depreciating asset, which all of them really are, is if you really, really, really enjoy it. Like if your if your client had a Ducati motorcycle, I'm sure he'd be like, "I don't care, John. It can depreciate all it wants to. That's fine." Well, it's, yeah, Ducati, and and he did. He did have a Ducati. <laughs> of Several of them, different models. Of course, he did. Yeah, but uh, that's all one. That's all fine and dandy until one day, either physically or or mentally, you can no longer work, and you need to rely on your yeah. accumulated wealth. And if you've stuck all your money in depreciating assets for decades, then uh, that's not going to work. So yeah. suffice it to say that my general uh, guidance to people is to lease a vehicle, take the extra money you had up front saved, put it into an investment. Now, the other, the other complaint I get is, well, I, I don't like monthly payments. The truth of the matter is, whether you have a real monthly payment or not, you do have um, a, an implied a, monthly payment, an implied monthly payment mm. uh, because you need to save monthly for the next car if you're going to buy it. Yeah, true. Right? Yeah. So you systematically need or, to be putting... Or the car needs to be maintained because older cars break down more frequently because they're they're not built to last forever even toyotas and and hondas which are are built for reliability there are parts that wear down over time and need to be replaced brake pads need to be replaced sometimes transmissions need to be replaced you need to account for that if you're going to own a car and a lot of people don't and then it becomes an unexpected uh a cost expenditure and people get very stressed over that and the one the nice thing about having a lease is for the most part aside from your windshield Pretty much every, or are you getting into an accident? Pretty much everything that could go wrong with the car is going to be covered by your your warranty. Once you get into owning a car in your a few years beyond purchase, you're going to be beyond the length of the warranty, and therefore anything that happens is going to be coming out of your pocket. So you have mm. to have the implied savings of replacing the car as well as maintaining the existing car that you need to account for. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave everyone with this thought. The only thing that it was made better in the past uh, that the phrase they, they don't make them like they used to where it really applies is Maytag washers and dryers. They last forever. Oh man. That's a whole different topic. That's a whole different <laughs> place to go, John, but that's demonstrably true. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I had, I had Maytags for 30 years and they were amazing. And uh, today that equipment is made for is designed obsolescence uh, as many other things are. Anyway, we should move on from this topic. Yeah. So quickly in terms of uh, financial considerations for a car, obviously there's going to be insurance that you need to purchase for the, uh, the vehicle. Um, other than that, we've covered the the topic of, you know, buying uh, versus yeah. leasing used versus new. Yeah. Uh, one, la one, one last item on buying uh, versus leasing and uh, new versus uh, used for people who are very, um, cash flow conscious, they should consider leasing a one-year-old vehicle. 
Now, hmm. not all not all car, car dealerships will allow you to do that, but there are some that do. And you allow someone else to take the hit on the initial depreciation when they drive it off the lot, which is about 30%. And you come in a year later and you get it at a substantially reduced price. So that's where I, I would encourage people who are looking to save money rather than buy or lease brand, brand new, lease a one-year-old car. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and then one other one I was going to ask you, Dad. Uh, now I, I think it's going to be a short answer. Type of vehicle in terms of brand, um, any... I, it doesn't I matter the, as much anymore. I, no, I don't think so. I, I think, yeah. first of all, I'm not an expert on the, all the different brands of cars. So, uh, suffice it to say, a lot of the cars these days are very high quality, much mm -hmm. much closer in quality from uh, best to worst than it was in when when I was young. And uh, yeah. so, I think it's just a matter of what uh, you're comfortable with. Uh, here in Canada, in uh, in southern Ontario, the only thing that I really insist on for a vehicle is uh to always get uh, try and get all wheel drive because it's so much better in the snow yeah agreed okay so we've bought a car we are now moving into probably the next major phase of life that uh, a lot of people go through and that's marriage so what are some of the considerations that people should have in advance of uh, making the decision to get married Okay, so we're not we're gonna not gonna be discussing uh, uh, soft topics on marriage, like uh, staying within your culture or anything like that. We're gonna be discussing the financial implications of marriage, yeah. and yes. so uh, uh, people oftentimes come from two different worlds when it comes to uh, the union, um, and that is uh, some people uh, come from families where their parents kept their money separately. They each, uh, worked, they each put money in their own bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And when it came down to making expenditures on groceries or rent or mortgage, they would each cut 50% or they would have some other arrangement and that, that can work. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 you have to be very careful about it. I think, um, personally speaking from experience, uh, and watching others, I think it's more effective when people pool their resources together into one yeah. account. That way you track expenses far more easily. Typically in a relationship, you're going to have one person who's more oriented toward financial matters than the other. And so that allows them the opportunity to track expenses more uh, more efficiently and, mm -hmm. and uh, then if necessary, have discussion with their spouse. So having a joint account, I think, makes a lot of sense. The other thing is in having a joint account from an estate planning perspective, should one person pass away, the money goes to the other person without having to run through the will and probate. And that makes things a lot easier uh, uh, in, in the event of that type of situation. So yeah. joint bank accounts make a lot of sense from that perspective. I, I agree. I personally have all of our assets pooled together from a, a simplicity standpoint. Um, it, I believe it also is beneficial from a marriage standpoint in that th everybody has the cards on the table. And I'm not going to try mm -hmm. and get uh, super philosophical here, but uh, I think sometimes what ends up happening, and I, I've seen it happen uh, in my experience with people that I know, keeping assets separately can lead to mistrust and it leads to the feeling that one spouse may have one foot out the door uh, when it comes to the marriage itself. And that, and that can be potentially uh, acrimonious and that can create a lot of friction in the marriage. You know, if, if some spouse starts, you know, setting aside money that the other spouse doesn't know about that can create uh, marital friction. And obviously the, the intention of a marriage is to be together forever. And so if, if that's your, if that's your goal and, you are intending to work together in a partnership, then you should realistically, you know, everybody should be, uh, you know, no holds barred. There shouldn't be anything uh, that is being hidden from the other spouse. It should be all on the table together. Now I know everybody's situation is different and somebody might come up with a, uh, a unique scenario where it makes sense, but uh, that would be overall our, our feeling on it. Uh, anything further to add that? Well, uh, yeah, on, uh, on the subject of marriage and, and financial matters, uh, in some cases, you have two people coming together that uh, have different, uh, have accumulated different levels of financial wealth. And uh, sometimes mm -hmm. you get a person that comes from uh, a family that's extremely wealthy, um, mm -hmm. or the individual that's being married has accumulated a lot of wealth, and they're marrying a person who has accumulated no wealth, or, or possibly may even have some debt coming mm -hmm. into the marriage. 
So depending on your circumstances, and, and I think we often hear about this more with the elite wealthy individuals like actors and, and uh, uh, sports athletes, uh, athletes etc., uh, where you may want to consider a prenuptial agreement. Mm. And uh, but especially if you if you come from a wealthy family, it's, it, it makes some sense to consider a prenuptial agreement. Obviously, there's going to be a discussion with uh, with the two partners that are coming together on the subject matter. But if one person is obviously uh, coming in with a lot more assets, they may want to consider that. Now, uh, just just one thing regarding the prenuptial agreement, though, is I think people have this haven't have this notion that it, it protects everything it only protects the assets you ac accumulate prior to the marriage once you are married everything at that point that you accumulate post marriage or during the marriage i should say is is fair game and, and available to uh to both parties in the event of uh, uh in, in the event that the marriage is dissolved down the road so that's just one thing to keep in mind it's only for assets that have been accumulated prior to the marriage. I, I know there's other um, uh, uh, facets of, of uh, getting married that we can get into at length. But really, uh, for the most part, I think people are interested in uh, financial matters. So typically, once you get married, the next stage becomes purchasing a home. And now we know today mm -hmm. there, this is a big problem Good in North home. America. You have such a huge uh, divergence in in terms of the assets of uh, our generation, the baby boom generation and Alexander's generation. And it's uh, very difficult for the younger generation to come into the housing market and purchase a house. So what are some strategies for, for saving money for a house? And I think the first thing I tell people uh, who are who are newlyweds or considered getting married is that they should be consider they should consider moving in with family members. Now I know that's not always possible, nor is it always desirable. Sometimes though, you got to bite bite the the bullet and do what it takes to get to the next step, and that is something I would strongly encourage people to do is is uh, stay with a family member for uh, typically it's just one one of the two uh, uh, one of the couple's parents. And to save money for anywhere from two to five years, as long as it takes. And yeah. that makes a big difference. It gives you a step up, gives you a nice down payment. The other thing I tell people who are not married, who are perhaps single, and they want to accumulate savings, is find a friend or a sibling or a cousin, someone who is willing to share accommodations with you. Mm. And that way you have the ability to save some money for an eventual down payment. So it's not always an issue of, well, I, I simply don't have the money. Well, if you're paying, as some people are here in Toronto, uh, $2,500 a month for rent, which is absolutely insane. Are they living uh, in a hovel, Dad? $2,500 yeah. isn't getting you anything. Okay. So what's the current number? Uh, at 1000 a 1000 3500 At least. It's a number here in the northeast part of the United States, a, a, a one two-bedroom apartment can run about $3,500 a month. Okay. So, yeah. so that's absolutely crazy. And so when for you're rent. paying that kind of, when you're paying that kind of money for rent, considering the average income, um, it becomes a, an impossibility to, to get, save up money for a down payment. So this is where it makes sense to, to share your accommodation with one or two other people to try and bring down that number as much as possible or live with a family member for an extended time frame. But when you're do you're living with a family member, that doesn't mean you take your extra cash flow and you spend it on a good time. It means yeah. you're systematically committing the, uh, the, the cash flow to a savings program. And uh, Alexander, do you want to elaborate a little bit on, on the types of savings programs we have here in Canada? Sure. Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, nobody's saying that you can't enjoy your money, but you also have to do so within reason. You have to understand what your primary motivations are and your goals are. And that should be, if you want to own your own home, that should be saving for a home. It's not just, you're not going to wake up one morning and the, and the money's going to be there. You got to make a conscious effort. So we have a, a few different savings vehicles here in Canada that make sense. The first one, which was just launched last year is the first home savings account. Uh, the first home savings account is a great tool because it combines the benefits of an RSP and a TFSA in that the contributions are tax deductible on the way in and the growth is tax free uh, on the way out. So there is no capital gains tax to be had on that. Mm -hmm. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to consume a sizable portion of your down payment 
through the first home savings account. So each, assuming you're doing this with a spouse, each individual can contribute up to $8,000 per year for five years. So you accumulate $40,000 each. So $80,000 of uh, contributions that uh, can be put towards a uh, home purchase in the future. To say nothing of the fact that there's growth of it on the money on the uh, or there should be growth on that money once it's invested. And then you have the tax deductibility of the capital on the way in. It should create a sizable portion of uh, assets available to you to then invest. Where are you okay, going to jump so, in? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> just to get throw this right back at you, Alexander, well, what are you buying with $80,000? A hovel? Or, no, but $80,000. Or, or are you buying a straw house? Because no, that's but, all $80,000 is going to be listen, large enough. It's eighty thousand that I didn't have available to me when uh, we were purchasing a house. That would have been helpful for us to utilize that. Well, uh, let's not get into your situation yes, because you know I, you know you had some help. I know I had some help, but the point is I had to have some help, and a lot of yeah. people have to have some help in order to uh, to get to their uh, to get the ability to own a home these days. It's very difficult to do it individually. So my point there is that the free home, uh, first home savings account is not sufficient. Uh, to accumulate a down payment for a house, especially here in the greater Toronto area. Mm -hmm. So we have other other savings tools available to us. And yeah. uh, it's uh, the other one that we utilize is called the tax-free savings account. And this would be the equivalent in the United States of a Roth IRA. So, we, so in this instance, the money you put into a tax-free savings account is not tax deductible. However, the growth is tax-free and the withdrawal is tax-free. So just because the first home savings account is designed specifically for a house doesn't mean you can't designate your tax-free savings account for whatever you like. And so you can use multiple savings vehicles for the same mm -hmm. objective. Mm -hmm. And with the tax-free savings account, Alexander, what are the, the numbers in terms of the contribution limits and the total available? Uh, the contribution limits for the uh, for the tax free savings account this year. Uh, let me just pull up the the updated number because it went up this year. I think it's now seven thousand dollars in Canada. So seven thousand dollars in Canada uh, right now is the uh, the annual limit. That number gets adjusted each year, uh, or not each year, but uh, periodically that number gets adjusted. So right now, if an individual had so my my year, I'm I'm a 1991 birth year. I was the uh, the first year of uh, eligibility for the uh, the TFSA program, um, and so if somebody my age or uh, uh, or older were to uh, get into a TFSA or would have uh, started a TFSA, they have about ninety five thousand dollars in total contribution room. So if they've missed contribution room in the past, you haven't utilized that space. You can still make up for that contribution room, so you could contribute potentially up to ninety five thousand dollars into a tax free savings vehicle. And now, and now we're talking. So you combine the first home savings account yes. for uh, and, uh, eighty thousand, eighty thousand plus the uh, tax free savings account, which is ninety five thousand each. each person. Mm -hmm. So now, between these two savings vehicles, assuming you maximize and are able to save, uh, you're going to have a substantial down payment that uh, will allow you to get into your first home. And if that, if you haven't been able to do that, and you have an RRSP registered retirement savings account. Uh, or the equivalent in the United States of uh, an IRA, then you can um, potentially use a portion of that money mm. for your first home. Alexander, do you want to get into the nuances of that? Yeah. So, you know, your your RRSP, similar to the, uh, the contributions on the first home savings accounts, uh, the contributions are tax deductible. So that provides people with a taxable benefit on the way in. Um, and then what you can do is you can uh, you can take out money from your uh, uh, from your RRSP tax free. It's a loan though; it's not a a true withdrawal. It is basically you are lending yourself money uh, from your retirement account. So you can withdraw up to sixty thousand dollars from your RRSP tax free to purchase a home, uh, your first home. I should specify that. And then you don't have to begin repaying that money until the second calendar year after withdrawal. And that repayment happens over a 15-year period. So that's another tool. 
So just a, a, a point of clarification on the repayment process. So what's going to happen is uh, you have to file a special document for that withdrawal. You don't just take the money out. And that document is sent to the, the t uh, tax department. They will send you a repayment schedule and they'll give you a minimum. So let's say for the sake of discussion, the minimum is $5,000. Sorry, let's, let's say it's $2,000 uh, on an annual basis. So you still want to make an RSP contribution during this process. So let's say at the end of the year, you want to put in 10,000 into your RRSP. Then at that point, uh, you put in the 10,000, the first 2,000 of the 10 is considered a repayment of the uh, loan. And the other 8,000 is permitted to be deducted against your income in that contribution year. So that's how the, uh, Home buyer's plan works uh, as part of the uh, withdrawal from the uh, registered retirement savings plan. Yeah, and so if at the end of the day you've uh, you've decided to per or you've decided to invest money into the uh, um, into the RSP and uh, you still don't have enough money left over uh, to to purchase home after you take out that sixty thousand dollars, then at that point uh, you're going to be relying on non-registered investments, and obviously those don't have any particular tax advantages when it comes to investing or uh, withdrawing the money. It's not tax deductible on the way in. It's taxable on the way out. Thankfully, we're getting taxed at a higher rate on the capital gains coming out. But uh, that's a, a bit of a sarcastic comment there. As anybody who would have heard our uh, previous episode with Kim Moody, if you didn't, please listen to it. Um, so the the, the non-registered account should be your uh, your fourth and final option, and it should be really only in uh, in a situation when you've exhausted the other ones and you still can't afford uh, to purchase a house. But you should, given the amounts that are available to you in those uh, in those different accounts, you should be able to at least a first home uh, be able to afford one without uh, dipping into the non registered. But anyway, that's uh, we're just going to put a. Uh, I think now is probably a good time to put a pin in that uh, conversation. There's a lot more that we want to get into when it comes to buying a house. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, it's a good time to uh, to take a break here and throw it back to Bill, and uh, we'll wrap this episode up and continue in the next one. Yeah, we'll wrap this one up for now, okay? If, for those of you who are listening, go to part two of this conversation because uh, we will pick this conversation up right where we left off. But for now, we got to leave you. Alex, if people want to get a hold of uh, of you, how do they do that? Best ways to go to our website, uh, that is med-wealth.ca, med-wealth.ca, or, or or email us at info at medwealth.ca. Beautiful. And the other thing you can do that's really simple is if you are not a subscriber to this podcast, become a subscriber by hitting the subscribe button or the follow button, whatever's sitting down there. Because that way you will be notified immediately when they drop the next episode of this podcast and you can listen at that point and if you like it tell people about it for crying out loud word of promotion is welcome here <laughs> to let people know about the podcast until next time i'm bill tucker on behalf of john and alex and everybody at medwealth financial thanks for taking the time to listen today and i would remind you that you can go out today and make today a great day or not it is up to you you have a choice until next time Thank you for listening to Prescribing Prosperity. Visit our website at med-wealth.ca. That's med-wealth.ca for more information or to connect with us for a consultation. Don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the hosts and their guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of IPC Securities Corporation. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investment advice. Always seek the advice of a qualified and licensed financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment or retirement planning. MedWealth Financial Services can provide a private consultation to help you determine the suitability of any guidance discussed on the show.